We're going to get started. Oh, DerbyCon. Tell me this isn't the best conference in the world. Yeah? I have the, I have the absolute privilege of giving my very first InfoSec talk uh, at DerbyCon 4. Uh, and it is, it is my absolute pleasure to be here before you, my honor to be here before you. But you all are here for a naked look at my methodology. So, uh, who am I and why do you care? Just really briefly. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Lang. I am a proud TrustSec consultant. Uh, I get to do fun things like, like red teaming and uh, all kinds of fun shenanigans in my clients' networks. Uh, it's all authorized, of course. They, they, they sign the statement of work. Uh, but uh, you find me on Twitter. My hobby has absolutely nothing to do with information security because I got unplugged just like everyone else. So let's talk about what this talk is about, what this talk is not about. First of all, uh, I want to give you an unrestricted look at one Red Teamer's consultant's methodology. Again, I'm a consultant. This is important to understand. And the reason why I'm putting this out there is because uh, uh, Red Teaming in the consultant world differs from Red Teaming in the internal world. And so if you're an internal Red Teamer, I need you to understand that your mileage is going to vary a little bit on this, okay? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my best to make it as applicable as I can. However, understand uh, that you're getting this from the perspective of somebody Somebody who has to operate on, say, in, from a red teaming perspective, say you know, six to eight weeks, okay, as opposed to an internal red teamer, your operations can go a lot longer. All right. Unfortunately, I don't have that luxury. It'd be fantastic, but it is what it is. Okay. To foster learning by example and failure, uh, as well as to drop some some handy stuff, at least stuff that I think is handy. But it's important to understand the perspective that this talk is coming from, and I'm just going to give you just a little bit of high-level context in terms of red teaming. Uh, in terms of target maturity, when I say red team, I'm not talking about a pen test. I'm not talking about a vul vulnerability assessment. Um, I'm talking generally right about here. Okay, so when, when we talk about a red team, I am making a few assumptions about my, my target, a few assumptions about my client. And some of those assumptions might be, for example, that you already have centralized logging. If you don't have a, a SIM and you're just kind of, you know, oh, yeah, we want a red team because CISO Mag says red team and it's all sexy. You know, hold on. Let's actually talk about what, what you have going and what you don't have going in your network. And then we'll see if you're, if you're in the right position for red team. And the reason why we do that is because we don't want you to waste your money. All right, red teams can be costly. All right, in fact, they are costly. Who am I kidding? So I, I, I do not want you to be wasting your money unnecessarily if you're not ready for that kind of engagement. Because the worst feeling for me as a consultant is to go into your network there's all kinds of vulnerabilities. We get DA in the first day, and it's a six-week engagement. We're just like, well, I, uh, that, that's not the best use of your time or your money. Okay, so we're making certain assumptions here. But in terms of the difference between penetration testing, red teaming, things like that, there is a key difference. And the key difference is the ability to slow down. And I need to state that a little more emphatically because this was a difficult lesson for me to learn. I came from the pen testing world. I, how, how many, wait, first of all, how many red teamers? You red teamers. What, there's like 20% of you. How many of you blue teamers? Get out. <laughs> oh, dang. So I, I, I came from a penetration testing role, all right, where, where a pen test was a week long. You could send three phishing campaigns in that week and still get domain admin by the end of the week. And those days are long, long gone. All right, so now on a red team, now it's like command paralysis where I'm afraid to type anything because I'm going to get caught. All right, so the, the point of this, of this talk is to, well, uh, give you some perspectives and some insights, some stories about failure and some successes, some things that you can use in your network. But why, why this talk? For those of you that raised your hand and, and you're like, yeah, I'm already a red teamer. You know, why, why am I here? Why, why you care? Uh, let me put it to you this way. Some of the, the best talks that I attend and the most valuable talks to me are the ones where I go and, and I'm not, I, I'm not expecting to have, you know, just this grand unveiling of knowledge. What I'm expecting is, to pick up about 10 to 20% new knowledge. All right, if you're a red teamer and you've been doing this for a while, chances are the vast majority of what you're gonna see in this deck you already know. Okay, uh, there, there's a guy I was talking to, Odili, he was hoping this talk was about uh, assembly. I'm sorry, man, it's not. Okay, but uh, uh, that's like, I don't know, next door or something. But uh, if that is, is where you're at, um, I want to give you a little bit of hope because the, the point of this talk is to maybe steer you in a slightly different, dire in slightly different direction or maybe change how you think just a little bit about red teaming and give you an additional 5%, an additional 10% on top of your methodology that might make you a better red teamer. That's the whole focus of this, okay? All right, so what's the agenda and, and what's this about? Well, I'm going to break this down very much like I would break down a standard red team engagement. We're going to talk about what happens before the engagement, the external portion, the internal portion, uh, the oh, social engineering, and then finally the reporting. Looks a lot like a pen test, but I'm going to break it down from a red teaming standpoint. By the way, these are not my animations, just FYI. 
All right, so every section that we're going to talk about, I'm going to include core principles. Uh, whether it's the pre-engagement, whether it's the reporting, I'm going to give you red team core principles. This is not just a tools talk, okay? And one of the worst things I could do for you is just to drop a bunch of tools and then turn you loose. That doesn't help anyone and it doesn't help your clients. All right, so from the, from the standpoint of methodology, one of the best things that I can do is give you sound principles or at least what I think are my sound principles. You might look at me and be like, you're all wrong. And that's fine, you're entitled to your opinion and I have the microphone. So, number one. Adversary simulation, not necessarily emulation. What's the difference? When I go into a target network, I'm simulating an adversary, which means, generally speaking, I can choose the path. Adversary emulation means I'm emulating APT XX, okay? And that's generally not, at least not in my opinion, the, the best value because if I can simulate an adversary, I can tailor the attacks based on the vertical, I can tailor the attacks based on the client, I can tailor the attacks based on their maturity, I can do those things instead of being kind of locked in to this box of a specific adversary. Number two, the goal is data, trophy systems, not domain admin. If, if the goal is domain admin, it shouldn't be. And if I ever go for domain admin on a red team, it is only as a stepping stone to get where I need to be. All right, one of the things I always ask during the kickoff is give me a system, give me an application, give me some piece of data that means something to you and would put you in the news if it walked out the door. And that changes things. Nobody ever says domain admin to that, ever. Okay, so that, that is the goal. Emphasizing stealth over speed. There are certain tools that I do not use on a red team any longer. And it's not that they're bad tools. And I, I do call out certain tools in this talk. It's not they're bad. It's just that for the purpose of a red team, it, it's, it's not the best fit. Maybe they're a little too fast. Maybe they're a little too well-known. Maybe there's too many signatures, et cetera. Speed is not the emphasis. Stealth usually is the emphasis. All right, active defense, I do encourage it. So, for example, if I'm going to send a fish, I want to see the actual response of my client. All right, and I will encourage it to a point. In other words, if there's like, all right, you're coming from Trust IPs, we're going to block everything. And if they ask me for a status update, and I'm like, all right, I, I got in, my connection is coming from here, and they just shut everything down. Okay, hold on. We, we do need to uh, suspend realism to a certain degree because uh, I only have so much time here. All right, so you kind of have to bear with me in that, in that part. The scope should be as open as possible, uh, including physical. Uh, you know, and I, I hear there's a lot. Physical isn't in my threat model. Well, maybe it should be because it works really well. Okay, because lots of people get in with physical. It works. All right. And this is red team, not black team. We're not going to we're not going to kidnap you. So, I mean, we're just talking about, you know, we're just talking about getting a device in the network. This is it's not a big deal. Okay, so, you know, expand the horizons a little bit. It's going to be fine. And then last, there should always be a tip your hand moment. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll ask my clients, hey, is it okay? Uh, I, I got persistent access. I achieved trophies one and two. Is it okay if I start making some noise? No, we, we don't want to make any noise. Well, why not? Well, because I'm on the audit committee and the InfoSec committee doesn't know that we're doing this. And I'm like, okay, um, it, it would be better if we did because that way they, you know, I, I could kind of coach them through some of the incident response. We could take a look at that. I could report on it. It'd be better for you as an auditor. But anyways. There, there should always be a moment in the red team where the, I, I lay the hand down, everyone sees what's going on, we deconstruct the entire path, uh, and then put together solid defenses based on that. All right, so before the engagement even starts, core principles on, on the pre-engagement cycle, I steer the client towards as open of a scope as possible, uh, which, which I had talked about, clearly define what can be done versus what will be done nod your head to this. If you're a red teamer, you understand this pain because what goes into the statement of work is something like, we may do things like um, uh, physical intrusion, wireless, social engineering, uh, internal testing, external testing, and the client looks at this and they're like, oh man, I get all this? Not necessarily. We will do what we have to do, including these things, if necessary. And so I'm always defining that. In other words, if I call up a user, ask for password, single factor my, my way in through VPN, I don't have to fish you. I don't have to wireless test you. Okay, so I always define what I can do versus what I will do. Set an assumed breach target date. This, in my opinion, this is best practice. Uh, and the reason being is I've only ever had one client, one, uh, where I've said, hey, uh, uh, can we talk about a date for when we cut over to assume breach scenario? Assume breach is really when we just pivot to an insider's perspective. And, and the client was like, no, you're going to fish and you're going to fish and you're going to fish until you can't fish anymore. And I'm like, all right, fine. So I spent four weeks fishing. I didn't get in and I would hand them an empty report. I'm like, I fished, you won, congratulations, secure, check the box, move on. But they're not. 
right? And that, that's, that's a problem. So we're always trying to set that, that assume breach date, all right? And then I am not ashamed to admit this, all right? I ask for the client's lockout policy, not necessarily the minimum password length, okay? But I ask for the lockout policy. Well, why would I do that? All right, specifically those attributes, whether they're set in Active Directory, whether they're set via password filter, whether they're set via you know, third-party product, doesn't matter. I ask for that because chances are, if, I'm not going to say chances are, you brute force on a red team, right? You brute force on a red team, you brute force on a red team. What's the first thing we do? We look for Azure, we look for O365, we look for brutable services, okay? And so understanding what their lockout policy is, you're saving them headaches and you're saving yourself a black eye. All right, in terms of like my average rate, if they refuse to tell me, I'll generally do about one every four hours. And maybe that's slow, maybe that's fast. I'm not entirely sure, and I'm trying to take it easy and not lock anyone out. You guys may go way fast, you may go way slower. But that's what I do when I haven't had any lockouts, uh, at least in recent memory. So, but again, on the kickoff call, I, kicked, I, I, I asked that question. All right, so the question, when does the red team engagement actually start? Is it on the kickoff call? Is it when you start your OSINT? The answer is, at least to me, is the minute I get the, the assignment email from my project manager. The very moment I do that, I'm out on LinkedIn. Why? Because it's the best. All right, go to LinkedIn. You must have a recon account by now. In other words, an account that is not associated to your real account, that is not connected to your real account, right? You, your, your, your accounts are separate. I sure hope so. All right, I set a repeating task to add connections. And I, I do this frequently. It's about once a month. I go out to LinkedIn, I click the network button, I start hitting connect, 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 and then I'm going to give you a shortcut for that. All right, and, it, and it's easy to scrape because, well, I, I can't talk about that. against LinkedIn's term of service. In fact, it's impossible to scrape LinkedIn. <laughs> All right, so number one, you build a decent profile. Be thorough, okay? This is not the time to be restrained in, in your personality or in yourself. You choose uh, attributes about your fake persona that you think are going to be attractive uh, to your target audience. Hint, hint. Okay. Number two, you click my network. You click my network, you see something like this. All right, you see those connect buttons? This is the best part of LinkedIn. This is so good. Man, you guys are going to love this. All right, you scroll all the way down to fill up the page. And then you scroll all the way down again. And you scroll all the way down. LinkedIn does this Ajax thing where like, uh, uh, as you keep scrolling, it keeps adding connections, right? Yeah, you, this guy here's laughing. He knows exactly what I'm going to do. All right, you, you keep filling the page and you keep filling the page. You keep, and I'm talking like a thousand of, of these things. You just scroll, take a sip of your coffee. This is great. All right, and then you open up browser dev tools. You run that little chunk of JavaScript code. <laughs> you connect to like a thousand people. Connections start rolling in. You do a dance because you're awesome. All right. So LinkedIn, do it. Do it today. Domains. I aged my domains for a long time, sometimes months, uh, sometimes days, but mostly months. All right. Uh, and, and the reason being is because there are really good security controls like domain tools out there that will take into account the age of domains when you are sending your phishing campaign or on your callback domain, and that'll be a red flag. So get a hold of some good domains and start the aging process, like a fine wine or a good cheese. You just want those aged for a good long time. They just taste better. Okay, reusable if possible. Uh, some, some groups burn all the domains. They just burn them to the ground. And then they start over and they buy new domains or they go with expired domains, and that's great. And, and if that works and you're, you're doing that, that's awesome. And I'm like, why ruin a good thing? If you have an awesome domain and it doesn't get caught, just keep using it. And so I go out and I, I check uh, Palo Alto, I check Checkpoint, I check Forcepoint, I check McAfee, Blue Code. I check those places to make sure that my domains are still healthy, healthy, because they're in the health category. Client name dash portal.com is not okay. Do not put your client name in the domain anymore. Why? Because at least the vast majority of clients that I test, they have services that, that send an email to security saying, Jason registered a domain that has your name on it. So block it and then block him and he's bad. So normally I, if I want to put my client name anywhere, uh, I will put it in the tertiary level domain, the third one over, not, not the secondary level, the tertiary level. So uh, client.health-portal.com. I normally do that, but just FYI, be careful because search transparency logs can burn you on this. Um, and if you use multiple clients tied to the same domain, this is generally a bad idea. Uh, so be very, very cautious with putting your, dom your, your client name in the domain. Much rather have uh, uh, domains that are, that are more reusable, more widely open, uh, and not associated directly to a client. Okay, C2 and phishing domains never overlap. 
This one is kind of obvious, but I need to state it. Um, I might burn through five or 10 domains uh, on an engagement of the payloads going one place, uh, persistence is going another place, C2, short, long, going different places. Uh, you know, so just keep those things separate. And then I submit domains. Uh, like I said, I, I, I gave you this list, Palo Alto, Blue Coat, Checkpoint, McAfee. Those are kind of the top four. And the magic categories that I'm shooting for is health, financial, and government. Well, why those three? Okay, and, and in fact, I, I was working with one of my Fortune small number clients that told me about these magic three categories. And, and they said, these are the three that you want to get. If you can get in any one of those, you are golden. Well, why is that? Well, in fact, on Palo Alto's best practices website for SSL-based decryption, their number one recommendation is do not decrypt health, finance, government, military, and shopping. Well, why would that be? HIPAA, PII, Pandata, nobody wants to see that. You certainly want your Palo Alto inside your PCI scope. You don't want, people, defenders don't want to be anywhere near that. Uh, audit doesn't want to be anywhere near that. So all that stuff gets left uh, uh, encrypted. And it's good, you know. Like I said, healthy domains. We like that. All right, tools. I'm not going to get too much uh, into tools, but I will give you this slide. And of course, I will make these slides available on Twitter, so um, you can you can take pictures or you can just uh, uh, follow me on Twitter, and I'll I'll drop them out there. Uh, tools for a passive recon: uh, Hard Cider that was made by Jason Ashton uh, at TrustSec. Uh, a mass uh, for certificate transparency. I use a tool that I wrote: cert uh, sh parse. Um, Pi Meta is good for searching metadata. Uh, GitHub searching uh, with uh, Truffle Hog or Repo Scanner, or you can just send an at request to uh, Hacking LZ. Uh, he is uh, he, he's the, he's the person who knows like you can just find anything on GitHub. So feel free to hit him up. And then uh, authenticated LinkedIn scraping uh, for content, you can use uh, a LinkedIn there. Um, and then Google Dorks for everything else. And these are some of my favorite Google Dorks. Uh, I love these. Uh, the top one, you know, you're, you're looking for Amazon. You're looking for you know uh, Pastebin things like that. The bottom one is my favorite because service desk people and help desk people generally hate their job. Uh, and so they want out as soon as possible. They're, they're just gonna litter their profile with all kinds of awesome information. So definitely one of my favorites. Breach data. Breach data is a treasure trove of information. Um, the email format, the password format, new user passwords. I, I group these by count and then throw them in the report. Very, very helpful. Um, and if you're not sure where to get started, if you haven't gone down this road, um, there are people in uh, in the place where I work. I'm not sure if Hans is here, but he has done a, a tremendous, it's, it's incredible what that guy's done with password breach data and cracking and stuff like that. It is very, very useful uh, to a red teaming organization uh, to have that kind of data. So if you're not sure where to go, um, well, there's... <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you started. Don't say everything anything good for you. All right. External. <clears throat> now we start getting to fun stuff, right? Core principles on the external just a little bit. Um, I always brood active directory from the external perspective, never internal and always through VPN. If you get internal access, if I get internal access, this is my methodology, not yours. If I get internal access, I do not brood active directory with one exception that might be curb root. Um, which is going to throw a different event ID, 4771, as opposed to 4624 um, in, in the log. Don't quote me on that. But I do know that Kerberos brooding is a different event ID than uh, um, like NTLM brooding or things like that. So that is kind of a difference, and it's still a reasonably new technique. Otherwise, I do not brood Active Directory from the internal perspective. Number two, and your mileage is going to vary on this one. Maybe you're a web app genius, and that's awesome. But generally speaking, from a consultant's perspective, when I'm, when I'm on limited time, web apps are not necessarily my focus. I will look at your web apps. However, it's not from a web app testing perspective. At TrustSec, we have an amazing group of web app testers, and that's all they do. They don't do red teaming. And what I might do is bring in somebody with that specialty onto the red team, uh, at least for that engagement, to look at those web apps. But it's not necessarily my specialty because they, they've grown extremely complex, in my opinion. So not necessarily the thing that I'm most gravitating towards. Um, and I do make liberal use of credential stuffing. If you're not familiar with that, we're back to ba password breach data. Um, get a hold of those credentials and start trying them. Uh, I, I tried uh, one of my targets. Uh, this was on an assessment two weeks ago. Um, I went and took their brand name. Um, it, was, it was a popular brand name and grabbed the credentials from uh, my, my password breach store and threw them at, at their website. 350 valid credentials, just like that. So it does work very, very well. Active Recon, these are how I do it. Uh, Aquatone, Dirt Search, NMAP. Um, typical tools that you would use uh, in a red team engagement, but just understand, um, and thanks to, uh, I think Scott pointed this out, um, for uh, like the NMAP user agent, that, that can bite you, because if you didn't know this, and I didn't know this until a little while ago, uh, NMAP has its own user agent, um, and it has NMAP in the user agent, so talk about getting blocked right away, 
Um, you can actually change that with, with, a, with a script parameter. Um, if you use, I don't know, now nah, you can't see it, but if it's, it's dash dash script args, and then you can uh, paste in the uh, the user agent that you want to see. And uh, if you're interested, uh, I wrapped all this into a tool that that I use on my engagements called Initial Recon. Um, that uh, it, it fires a mass, it fires a LinkedIn scraper, it fires metadata scraper, it fires all that stuff. Um, and the the code uh, sections are up there if you want to go out and get them on GitHub. Um, it's helpful. Um, at least I think it's helpful. It's good for my methodology. It might not work for you. Uh, if you don't have something like this, it'll be a good thing to get you started. And then lastly, on the external part, NTLM brooding is still super hot. Um, Office 365, Exchange, Skype, Link, um, a good place for testing what a client has is uh, testconnectivity.microsoft.com. Otherwise, I will go out to outlook.microsoft.com, put in admin at target.com, and I'll get redirected to whatever their ADFS instance is, and that's always really helpful. Speaking of ADFS, uh, these links were dropped at Troopers 19. Uh, these are some less obvious sources for NTLM brooding, so if you go to like adfs.target.com, um, and then, and in that, those are valid URLs, so that, that ADFS is a valid domain taking you to an ADFS instance, those URIs, I'm laser pointing at my screen. <laughs> Those URIs at the very bottom um, are uh, open NTLM portals. So you can send your, your brute force attacks there. Very, very helpful. Social engineering, because everyone loves Bob. Core principles in social engineering, phishing. Uh, this is how I get around Proofpoint. In fact, I, Proofpoint, uh, I don't, mm, bite my tongue, hold on. Proofpoint is good. Um, uh, at, it's probably very it's probably very very good at stopping a lot of spam but if you are going to be targeted and this is true of a lot of controls right yeah as red teamers we understand this um the I, I never as much as i dog and like antivirus i never tell my clients to uninstall it because it serves a very very good purpose which is blocking like com commodity malware commodity ransomware that kind of stuff it does serve a good purpose proof point serves a good purpose it just doesn't serve the purpose when when i'm sending the email and here's how that works you send five at five emails max at a time. All BCC'd, works great, with 15 minutes in between sends, and I send from Office 365. A uh, little caveat there, uh, when you log into Office 365 to send your fish, the IP that you are connecting from gets put into the headers of that message. So be sure you are connecting from a VPN tunnel, okay? Send links, not attachments. You do those things, and you just kind of take it slow. You're not blasting out 100 emails at a time. You're, you're not going to have any worries about proof one. I lead off with my, my latest tradecraft, and then I downgrade as I get a feel for the target environment. Okay, so if you have like all custom C2 and you're just the shiz, you're all this hot stuff, but you know, there's like PowerShell version two in the environment, don't necessarily burn all the stuff that you spend a lot of time writing. Okay, adjust your attack path to the maturity of the client. Right? Because if you're so far ahead of them, you, you might be giving them things that they can't necessarily remediate, at, le at least not in, in any meaningful fashion, if they even understand it. So point being is adjust your, the, your turn that dial back, I guess, if you will, um, to, to compensate for their sensitivity. And eventually, eventually, your clients will outpace you. And you'll be like, shoot, this is, I, I gave you everything I had and you, and you caught me. I fished and I fished and I fished and you caught me. And that's kind of a good place for, for them to be. All right, and once again, eventually uh, pivot to assume breach. I do this about 50% of the way through the engagement time. If it's a six-week engagement, it'll generally be about two and a half weeks, maybe three weeks, maybe two weeks um, going into that, uh, just because that, that provides better value. It provides better value for the client. Um, and, you know, if, if you're done evaluating the perimeter, then you're done evaluating the perimeter. So time to move on. Uh, infrastructure automation. Uh, Automation is getting to be, uh, or I should say infrastructure, uh, building it up and tearing it down is getting to be a pain, uh, especially when you need different servers for everything and whether you're doing uh, AWS or whether you're doing Azure, whether you're doing on-prem, uh, what I do is I use Ansible. Um, if you follow me on Twitter for any length of time, you know I'm kind of an Ansible junkie. I just gave a class pretty much on Ansible. It's, it's you know, a ton of fun. Um, but what Ansible is, just really, really brief primer. Um, it's an open source uh, platform put out by Red Hat, maintained by Red Hat, uh, that gives you really solid configuration management and application deployment purposes. It uses YAML files. It's really easy uh, to get into. Um, even if you've never coded, it, you're not even coding in YAML. You're just like typing in YAML. It's, it's really, really straightforward. Um, there's no agent. It's totally agentless. You need SSH and Python. That's it. Uh, if you can get Python on the target, um, you, can, you don't even have to have Python on the target. You can use Ansible to install Python on the target, uh, which is fantastic. 
um, and then modules make up the functionality. So for example, these are some, uh, these are some tasks that are uh, inside my uh, create C2, C2 server playbook. Um, so the name of the task, cloning a packet, installing a packet, cloning carbon copy, et cetera, et cetera. The modules that we're using. So in this case, the module is called git command and then git. I'm calling the git module twice. And then I'm passing the arguments. It's actually really, really straightforward. And then once you have all that put together, you run it inside a playbook. So in this case, I'm running the new C2 server playbook uh, against the host file, and it goes out and it builds all my stuff. Ansible is multi-threaded, so you can run this against five C2 servers at once, and they all get built out the exact same way to the desired state configuration that you're looking for. Really, really, really good tool. Uh, if you want to geek out about that, I'll be happy to do that with you. Uh, and then macros chat and attachments for, for uh, sending payloads. Uh, safe payloads, generally speaking, uh, a modified Cactus Torch will, will, is reasonably safe in terms of getting you in the door if you're looking to get code execution immediately. Uh, otherwise, uh, safer might be registry-only mods. Uh, so, for example, if you're looking to land with, like, uh, uh, persistence or something along those lines, uh, registry key mods are generally very safe. Uh, we, have to, we have yet to be caught yet on that, at least as far as I know. Uh, VBA stomping and Evil Clippy, uh, uh, the, the Walmart uh, folks, they did a great job. Harold and his team did a great job on this. Evil Clippy, the Outflank uh, guys, I know this is Stan's work primarily. Uh, fantastic tools that, that we all use that are, that are really, really good in terms of making those macros even more evil and less detectable, and that's what we want. Uh, and then lastly, uh, template injection, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, template injection is great because you can actually send a docx in the door, uh, and then when the user opens that docx, it goes out and pulls in the docm or the dot gif or whatever and it, it all works great okay so really that that evil template dot gif is just a doc m that's hosting on my web server it pulls the template in the user gets prompted they click enable content and then you get your shell or your rc or whatever it is you're looking for all right uh azure information protection uh Advar and hans uh, gave a fantastic talk on this yesterday Leverages Office 365's uh, RMS uh, to encrypt the Office document uh, to specific recipients, which is really cool. It's impossible for defenders and sandboxes to evaluate without the user's credentials. You need to read that again. When you send an AIP encrypted document and it reaches their environment and, and the user's like, this is spam, and they forward it. If they can, if you haven't marked the do not forward box, if they, if they forward it over to security, security's going to open it and they're going to be like, I can't open this. It's encrypted. I need your password. And you just be like, I'm never supposed to give you my password. Security's going to be like, but I need your password. And it's going to freak out. It's great. <laughs> Does not require your target to have Office 365. Uh, you can send this to a Gmail account and they'll just get prompted to do an installation. Here's what it looks like. Uh, you, you install the uh, Azure Information Protection Agent. Uh, you go out to protect it. You select the email address, your target's email address. Sorry, that's permissions. Can you guys even see that? Yeah, you can. Heck yeah, you can. You select the permissions, in this case, view only. You put in the target's email address. And then if you're feeling, if you're feeling especially naughty, you specify an expiration, which is just great. You know, because like if you only want that fish to be live for 24 hours, then you can just put in 24 hours and send it to them. And after 24 hours, poof, it's gone. It's like... Ah, Mission Impossible stuff. Self-destructs. <laughs> All right, so uh, Azure Information Protection, watch this talk. Um, I, got, I got a link in there right for this, this. This talk happened yesterday. Those guys did a fantastic job. And then on the internal side, this is, this just, this is really where it gets fun, right? Core principles on the internal. On a red team, this is what I'm prioritizing. Once I get access into the target environment, I'm not just invoke mass mimi catching everything. All right, as fun as that is. <laughs> I mean, who isn't like creds just raining back in, okay? But seriously though, cookies, bookmarks, file shares, SharePoint. Remember, the ability to slow down. What are you doing with this step? You're gaining valuable knowledge about the target's environment, okay? You're, you're not just, you know, spraying and praying. You're, you're looking for things that are of value because how many times on red teams? Have you found documents that have credentials, documents that have network diagrams, documents that have sensitive data, open file shares that have sensitive data? Do spend the time in that due diligence. You might be able to achieve the trophies just with that. You don't necessarily have to be moving laterally. And why move laterally if you don't have to? That's one of the noisiest things you could do in the target network. So if you have the right access to those data stores, use that access and accomplish the goal because that's what an attacker would do. That's what I would do if I was the attacker. All right. Curb roasting, I love it, I love it, but I got to dial it back. Okay, you got you to pull the reins back on a curb roast. If you're just firing, get users' SPNs, all right, from Impacket, 
then what's happening is you're sending those events to Active Directory, a ton of them, and if the defender's on top of it, they've written a threshold alert. So anything more than, uh, I don't know, what, four or five, I mean, a day, if ever. Uh, so in my case, generally speaking, I'll start out no more than one an hour, and that's after doing research on the account. Okay, now this is obviously assuming credential access. Okay, but you're, you're doing the research on the account to see if it's even a viable target. All right, and when I choose Kerberos, I, I used to Kerberos, I'm not going for domain admin. Okay, true story. I, I was I was Kerberosing user accounts, and uh, uh, actually I shouldn't say it. I was doing reconnaissance against user accounts that had service principal names, and it was like all all the account names were like SVC underscore every single one, and then there was one that was John Smith, like J Smith, right? And in the description it said infosec. D come on, oh, that's like like, and so I I, I sent an email to my contact. I'm like, this is a honeypot. He's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, so I was actually chatting with a, with a friend of mine about this last night, about how to do like Kerberos Deception, uh, make 20 accounts and make them all with different user IDs. And then if you want to be really evil in your 20 fake accounts that you have disabled with or uh, that you have enabled with ridiculously long passwords that will never crack, go ahead and make your J Smith user account because then attacker is going to show up and be like, ah, oh, that's honeypot. I'm not going to grab that one. And they're going to grab the rest of them. That's like pure evil. But this is a red team talk. Shoot. Okay. I do purple teams too. It's fun. All right. Initial landing callback of five to 30 minutes, depending on the time that I have and the sophistication of the target. Okay. So there are some times when it is fine to just throw the barn doors open, so to speak, and like go full interactive mode on your beacon. Okay. But that's after you've done a little bit of analysis. That's after you've had your shelf for a little bit and, you know, you, you, maybe you've downloaded some stuff. You've taken your time for a day or two. It's not a big deal. Slow down. And then once you figure it out that they're not catching on to your C2, then yeah, full interactive because that's the best. All right. I test all my commands in my lab before firing live, at least as much as I can. Okay. Just a little bit of a word about my lab. Um, I went out to eBay. I bought a Dell R710, $500. Okay, we have an MSTN license, which I imagine a lot of you probably do. And I, I went out and I built full Active Directory lab. Okay, I installed uh, the fantastic, the one and only Splunk threat hunting app by, uh, by Olaf, um, Sysmon, uh, and Windows Defender. Um, and, and I configured all this, and, and it's, it, it's, I cannot tell you the amount of times that I have used my lab on engagement f to produce better results. Say, for example, this. I, don't, I hope you guys can see that. So this is my... Shoot. That's not helping. Nope. All right. You just have to take my word for it. So this is uh, all the Windows systems in my environment. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at the Sysmon event logs to see which processes are establishing connections out to the Internet and on what frequency. Well, why would this be useful? Because as a red teamer, if I can get into one of those processes, well, that's, that's more real looking. Right? And so do that. Take that step of investing in the Splunk license. Seriously, all you have to do is go out to Splunk's website and request the developer license, right? The, the free license is 500 megs. The developer license is 10 gigs a day, and they'll, they'll, they'll give it to you because Splunk's awesome like that. Okay, so go out there, request that license. It's valid for six months, and then you can import all the stuff and do your own research on this because this is what the defense is seeing. And once you know what the defense is, see is seeing, you know how to manipulate it, okay? You know how to work around it, and then you know how to help them with it. All right, tools, I, let, let's get into a little bit of tooling. Um, on a red team, okay, so I'm gonna divide the room. All right, brace yourself. This is what I almost never use on a red team. Crack map exec, as much as I love it, I love it. Marcello, you're awesome, okay, I love it. Internal brooding, like I said, I don't do it. Curb root might be an exception there if I think their, their defense is not gonna catch that. Power exploit, I I've, I've generally do not run much for PowerShell unless it's something that I've wrote that I know from a sysadmin perspective is relatively inert. For example, querying Active Directory, um, I, I'm not gonna use PowerView, I will do something that I've written myself. Okay, tools that I sometimes use on a red team. Bloodhound, depending on the switches. Thank you to Scott and the Bloodhound crew for pulling me up to speed there and not getting caught. Uh, Mesploit auxiliary modules are still fantastic uh, to run, run slowly. Um, modified Mimi Cats, um, and, it's, and by the way, I don't mean like log on passwords. Please do not run that uh, on, your, on your red team. Uh, please don't do that. Please don't start flipping the W Digest keys. Don't do that. Um, you know, just kind of 
pull back the reins on that because Mimi Katz has so much more to offer than just log on passwords. Carlos gave an incredible uh, two day training on that just on Mimi Katz, it's like Mimi Katz and Kekio. That's all it was. Okay. And then Cobalt Strike, obviously, I'm not running anything stock. Uh, everything is going to be all uh, modified, malleable profiles, things like that. Okay. And when I modify, just FYI, when I modify my, my Cobalt Strike profile, I go out to Raf's blog. And I grab every single attribute that I have and modify it, every single one. Okay, so I will go out to an, I, I will make an authenticated call out to a service that I sign up for. Okay, so like me personally, I like health. So for example, uh, like my, an old health insurance provider, something like that, that I might still have an account for. Fire up Burp, grab all that traffic, and then I configure the gets, the posts, the stagers, all to look very, very close to that. I do not rely on automated tools for that. I like, I like handcrafted, artisanal, farm-to-table, malleable profiles that way. Um, so that's how I like to do it. Okay, and then what I always use. All right. I'm pretty much every engagement, I'm going to be using these things. All right, I'm going to be using a SOX proxy. I'm going to be using proxy chains. I'm going to be using LDAP search, Kerberos manipulation, and literally anything from Durkion. Okay, however, understand that those tools are going to be modified. All right, even Impacket. Impacket is fantastic. Impacket is one of my favorite toolkits of all time. I just love it. Okay, but I will still modify it. Why? Because the defense can see this stuff. All right, they can actually see the parent process chain. When I fire WMI exec, that is what they're seeing on the command line. They're seeing cmd.exe slash capital Q slash C echo, blah, blah, blah. And it, it just looks bad. Right? It looks like somebody just barfed all over the command line. It's horrible. Okay, and it sticks out like a sore thumb if you know what to look for. All right, and so what will I do? I'll go into the script. And I will modify the, the, the command switches. Uh, if I'm feeling adventurous, I'll, I'll try and modify the communications. Okay, but I will change every, almost everything that I can change about the tool. All right, and here's the good news about that as a red teamer. What that will do is that will lead you to writing better detections for your own stuff. For example, I wrote this for Impacket. This is a Splunk query that detects, what, three or four Impacket tools that are just, you know, stock. And that's great because if I can detect it, then I know what I can change. And this is the, the Graber loop that, that I think he blogged about or talked about, right? You, you write uh, better detection, so you know what you have to change, you can write better tools. All right, and that loop is priceless as a red teamer. If you're not doing that, if you're not modifying tools and then writing detections for that so you can change the tool, you're missing out on, on actually a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun because that, why, why do we do red teaming? It's, it's a puzzle, right? Why do blue teamers blue? Well, it's a puzzle. We like, we like to solve puzzles. All right, and this is a really fun puzzle and a really fun challenge to solve. So I encourage you to give it a shot. Okay, even if you're low privilege, uh, on a target, there's still some awesome stuff that you can do. That involves Mimikatz. Okay, if you're reasonably certain that you're not going to get caught, you can run Mimikatz. It's not going to target LSAS because you're not running log on passwords. What you are running is DPAPI to hit the Chrome process. Okay, so you make a copy of the login data because that's where the, the plain text, uh, and it's not plain text, it's DPAPI. So that's where the credentials are stored. You make a copy and then you fire Mimikatz at it and you can pull plain text credentials back. And when I say plain text, I, I should say decrypted. Okay, you pull those credentials back to the screen, and whatever the user has stored in Chrome, you now have access to. Sometimes it's a lot of personal stuff, all right, but sometimes it's a lot of corporate stuff, especially if, they're, if they have Chrome rolled out. So it's very, very useful to do that, and you can do it as a low-privilege user. If you do not want to fire Mimikatz in the target's memory, it's understandable. You save off the cookies file or the login data's file. Uh, you acquire the user's password, and, I mean... It's not, not too hard to do. You're all red teamers, right? My last engagement, my physical guy called up someone. It was just like, hey, I'm closing on help desk tickets. Do you have any open ones? And they're like, ah, oh, the printer. I hate the printer. Blah, 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 blah. Just went on and on about the printer. And my guy was like, yeah, the printers are awful here. And, you know, it's not a big deal, but I will take care of all that for you. I just have to verify you are who you say you are. Oh, yeah, sure, my password's, you know, password one, two, three. It's, it's actually not that hard to get user's password. All right, follow steps here for decrypting the user DP API keys. Um, and here is on uh, Will's blog here. This was a ton of fun. I, I took his entire blog, went through it step by step, and learned a ton about DP API. I would strongly encourage you to do that. It's a, it's a worthwhile exercise to do. Okay, persistence uh, and, and movement. Uh, for persistence, honestly, uh, just really anything that's on Hexacorn's uh, website, uh, you just target HKCU, um, and there's all kinds of just fantastic stuff. Some of it is like really third party sp uh, specific. Some of it is fantastic um, that that I that I love using. So um, if you're not uh, an avid reader of Hexacorn, you should be. 
common deal hijacking. There's a fantastic talk that was given, uh, I think this morning about com hijacking. Um, it really went into the nuts and bolts of it um, and, and even how to weaponize it with a com proxy. And that is, that's super important. Otherwise you're going to foobar the environment. Uh, Procmon is your, is your absolute best friend there. Um, I I even got a bullet point on com proxy. Okay. So um, read the article from, from Leo. He did, he did an incredible job on that. Um, and we'll, we'll get you into proxying com calls so you don't break the system because truthfully com hijacking while it's cool and it's, it's, it's sexy, it can be a little risky to do on a target environment because you can trash the system if you pick the wrong class ID. So do your testing, use a com proxy and you're in a much safer position for weaponization. All right. And then blend in. Blending in, it's kind of more of an art than a science, right? So like this, and this is again where Splunk is amazing. So when we talk about blending in, so on a target system that's run the Splunk Universal 4, I'm, I'm going to pick on Splunk for just a minute, okay? The, these sub-processes for Splunk, like Splunk-PowerShell and Splunk-80mon and Splunk-Netmon, they run every minute. They pollute the, the uh, uh, security log with 4688s that, meet, that, that kick off this pr starting process. Okay, so if this process is running all the time, all the time, it's kind of a safe bet, kind of. It's safer than not doing. It's kind of a safe bet that if you take your naughty process and make it one of those processes that have probably been excluded from Splunk congestion, then chances are you're a little bit safer. All right, you're not going to get caught, at least not as fast. Okay, and so now, now obviously, I'm I'm picking on Splunk here. You need admin rights to do this stuff. I mean, I'm 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 not going to BS you. You know, in order to do this kind of stuff, you have to have an admin presence on the system because Splunk actually did a good job locking down uh, the privileges on their target directory. But the point is, is that if you see processes running continuously on a target system, find one of those processes, stick your payload into that directory, rename it, or just call it that name in another directory. Because if they're excluding that process only by name and not by path, you're, you're not going to get caught. All right. Deal of hijacking. Still awesome. I sat down, I opened up Procmon, I just kind of monkey with Splunk for a little bit. Um, and there's like, there's like a ton of calls in, in the Splunk universal forwarder where it says name not found and you can just kind of, you know, pick your deal poison and <laughs> you can just mess with it. Again, you need admin rights for this. So, I mean, it's, you know, your mileage may vary, but point being is that deal of hijacking is still very valid. And because the it's not like a cmd.exe calling this process. It's a legitimate process. It's probably been whitelisted calling that. You're probably safer to do that. It's still difficult to detect. Okay, com hijacking just a little bit. Uh, th this was fun. Um, the, uh, the, the SI host process. Anyone know what the SI host process does? <laughs> so the SI host process uh, in Windows 7 and Windows 10 is responsible for uh, looking at Windows activation status. And so when, when, we were, uh, uh, when we were giving our, our, our black hat training two years ago, we were using a Windows 7 image. And um, uh, I, I kind of I turned the students loose for the com hijacking models. And I'm like, all right, just find something awesome. Just, just go to town. Because they get super excited and they tell me what the class IDs are. It's great. Don't, sh don't tell them that. Okay, so, but then what, what they do is they find something like this in the SI host process. Okay, name not found. And, and they, they, they stick a com hijack in there. Well, what happens is that when Windows boots up, have you, ever, you ever use the trial version of Windows? It always says in the lower right-hand corner, it says, you know, you must activate Windows, right? So a student came up to me all excited. And he's like, hey, I found this com hijack in this, pro, in this process called SI host. And I don't really know what it does, but I don't get prompted to activate Windows anymore. I was, <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? And I went over to his system, and sure enough, the message was gone. And, and so I was like, all right, well, well it's, it's Windows 7. You could hijack anything in Windows 7, right? So, so we changed over to Windows 10 uh, for, for Black Hat a month ago. And, and, and I told the story, and a student comes up to me, he's like, Psh, still works in Windows 10, you still do it? And I was like, sweet free Windows, right? You know, that's great. <laughs> All right, so reporting. <sighs> All right. <laughs> reporting, communication, okay. I'm, I'm gonna divide the room a little bit, because once again, it's my methodology. All right. On status updates to clients, use caution. OK, this can bite you and it has bitten us a lot. All right. And that's not to say that you should lie. I am not saying that. What I am saying is that mm, you need to take a, a, a pulse on the client because some clients are amazing and some want to win. 
And that's not the point of the engagement. It's not for the red team to win. It's not for the blue team to win, right? It's to test controls and make recommendations based on your findings, all right? It, it's, it's not necessarily a, a, a game or a contest, all right? And so when, when I share status updates, if, if I think that my client is going to snipe me with this, I'll just be like, yeah, you know, we had a great week and ran some port scanning and, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of great controls. And, you know, normally it's just kind of a response that needs to go back to uh, um, a, a committee or something like that. If I can tell the client loves security and wants, uh, e either wants us to uh, find new attack paths or things like that, I'll tell them everything that we're doing. But the point being is that I use caution. I, I don't just go into it like, well, ran Mimi Cats, got DA. And, I'm, you know, it's like, I don't necessarily do that. All right. In the report. That is where everything goes, everything. And by everything, I mean everything, especially in the narrative. Because when working with clients and doing a red team, this is not, you know, your grandpa's pen test where it's just like, okay, take findings, give to audit committee. I take things, I give them to the engineer. And then the engineer does the, it's not, it's not that. Generally speaking, in doing red teams, you're working with interested clients. Okay. And so the, the, in my experience, the findings are important but they're important from an audit perspective. The, the security team wants the narrative. That's what they want, and they want everything spelled out, and they should. And I encourage security teams to actively break down every part of the engagement because that, that's what should be done to develop better detections. And so do not withhold the secret sauce in the report. Please don't, okay? Gives everyone a black eye. Don't do it. All right, findings. I tell my clients this out of the gate every single time we kick off a red team. Do, I, I'm not going to give you an SSL finding. Oh no, SSL version two. I'm I'm not going to do that. Okay, unless I unless I actively exploit it somehow. All right, I, the findings that I gonna that I, that I'm going to give are probably going to be fewer in number, higher in quality. And what what I mean by that is they are going to be directly connected to the path of exploitation or the path of compromise. Okay, so that's that's my personal methodology for giving findings. So far, it's worked very well. All right, and then consultants, this is the best. Seriously. If you're not doing this, if you're just shipping a report and then moving on, where's the near steakhouse? Okay, you're 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 doing it wrong. All right, the best moments are when you follow up with the defense. And the way that I always end my my last call with the with with my client is I, I usually say something like this: I will never ever leave you hanging out on a limb. If you have questions about the report, if something isn't answered, if somebody puts your feet to the fire, they want to know how Jason did this or this, just call me. Call, text, signal, email, anything, and I will be there. I will get on the phone. We'll schedule a meeting. Uh, I've, I've flown out to clients and done in-person uh, debriefs. Point being is that always be there for the defense. And when you do that report readout and, and you start to see the light bulbs go on, there is no feeling. There, there is no shell that produces that kind of high. Okay, so do not... Uh, withhold when, when it comes to giving the defense all of the goods that you have, because that's, that's frankly what you're being paid to do. Okay. That's it folks.